We've looked at Northern Renaissance art in the 15th century, but now we want to look at Renaissance art in Northern Europe in the 16th century. And we're going to look at uh, a few Netherlandish artists, uh, Bosch, uh, who is from the North Netherlands, and Bruegel, who is from Flanders, the South Netherlands. And we're also going to look at some German artists, uh, particularly Albrecht Dürer and Hans Holbein, and I probably will bring in or mention uh, Lucas Cronach as well. So the first artist we're going to talk about is uh, Hieronymus Bosch. Hieronymus is the Latin version of the name Jerome. Uh, we call Bosch Hieronymus because that is how he signs his paintings. And he does sign paintings uh, at the bottom, you know, just where the tradition is to do it today. We don't know how old he he was when he died, so we don't know his birth date, is what I'm saying. Um, there is a picture of him in what is called the Codex Aris, uh, the pictures of uh, famous people, uh, and he looks like a very old man. Uh, but we do know that he died in 1516, so he was active at the end of the 15th century and into uh, the first two decades of the 16th century. So I suppose you could kind of think of him as around 1500. The work of art we're going to look at actually is usually dated something like 1500 to 1510, um, but it is not a firm exact date. Okay, where is he from? We said he was from the North Netherlands. He's from a town called Hetogensbosch, which translates something like the Duke's Woods. Uh, Bosch, if he were English, uh, would be named Forest or Woods, but you must use Bosch. Uh, I also will point out that it has a C in it. It's like Bosch, say, the spark plug manufacturer, not like Bosch and Humbug with uh, B O S. No C, H. Spell it with a C. Um, almost all of his paintings refer to the follies and the sins of mankind. It's uh, a very frequent theme in his art. And many of his works of art are filled with monstrous devils uh, and hybrid creatures, things that are made out of, of different parts of different animals, or sometimes they're giant animals, like giant birds or giant uh, plants. Um, a lot of times when people think of these sort of monstrous creatures, which we see here uh, in uh, the hell wing of uh, Bosch's Garden of Delights, which we'll be looking at, uh, they think of Bosch. Um, but of course, all of the northern artists, when they conceived of devils, uh, made them uh, in, uh, when they conceived of devils, uh, conceived of them as something that was truly monstrous, uh, made up of different parts of animals and humans fused together. Uh, we sometimes say they, were, they are hybrid, um, because that is what, against the way God made them. That's, that is truly monstrous. Uh, and uh, think back, uh, we showed you Schongauer's um, um, temptation or torment uh, of St. Anthony when he was tormented by all of those uh, hybrid devils. Uh, but Bosch is extremely imaginative in showing you here the torments of hell and the ever-present uh, example of evil in the world with all of these devils. So he is probably rightly um, considered to be one of the foremost painters of devils and hell scenes. Uh, but that's not all he does. Um, he actually sometimes has heaven scenes and nativities and adorations of the Magi, although there's often something, uh, some sinister element within them. In other words, in Bosch's paintings, folly and evil are always lurking. This is the work we're going to look at. It's uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights. We think that it was painted fairly late in his life, around 1510. And as you can see, it is a triptych. It has a large centerpiece and two narrower side pieces, which are hinged and can close. But the subject is something that is 
unique in the history of art. Before we talk about the subject, let's talk a little about the composition, the style. Uh, the painting is laid out with a very high horizon and has just a multitude of these different figures and objects within it. It's sometimes been compared to something like a tapestry, you know, just filled with images. And indeed, when you go to the Prado in uh, Madrid and you stand in front of this picture, you'll have to contest with a lot of other people standing in front of the picture. Uh, they're going in, they're examining it, and they're looking at it. They say, you see that? What's there? What's there? You know, and uh, you know, they really spend some time um, trying to look at all the details and see all the uh, imaginative uh, uh, objects and uh, figures that uh, Bosch has created. So you have this very high horizon then, uh, which gives you this sort of overall uh, design. And then when you look at the individual forms, you'll see uh, that they look very three-dimensional. Uh, it is designed with a clear foreground and then a middle ground. And you can see the, how the, the bushes uh, kind of dip down there. You have your middle ground. And then a background where you have this great pool and then actually a far background uh, right against the horizon, these little blue mountains, little atmosphere back there. Uh, and, you know, if you just sort of step back, you get this overall surface pattern. If you go forward, uh, you see all of these different details. Um, when you look at the figures, and you can see the figures turn in space, they, uh, they, they cavort, uh, they, they take on a variety of postures. Uh, but they have been suggested they look kind of doll-like in a sense because they do have little shading. They're not uh, have a deep chiaroscuro, a deep dark shading. Um, but they show up very well against the colors of the other forms. And uh, you know we have no doubt that they can turn in space. Uh, yeah. It, that uh, illusion of solidity is there even though it's not uh, created with a great deal of shading. Okay, this is looking at uh, the detail in the center and you know we're pretty close up to it. We're going to get even closer. Uh, you might notice there's a lot of sort of giant, it looks like uh, seed pods or plants. Uh, as well as uh, uh, different animal forms. Now, one of the things about Bosch's painting is we don't know what he called it. We don't know what he meant by it. Uh, it's given a conventional name, the Garden of Earthly Delights, or sometimes just the Garden of Delights. Um, and that is how it's identified. That would be uh, the title of it, even though we don't know what Bosch or his patron's title actually was. Um, we're not positive. We know that it was early on owned by the Count of Nasa. Um, that's Nasa in Europe, not in the Caribbean. Uh, and um, we think he may have been the original patron for it. But one of the great puzzles of iconography has been to try to figure out what does the Garden of Earthly Delights mean? And there are many interpretations. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about two specific ones, and I think I will talk to you a little bit about one that I think is absolutely wrong. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, but there have been interpretations that say, okay, this is uh, people, uh, now this is, uh, people before the flood of Noah, or uh, this shows you the golden age. Um, there is also what I'm going to call the moral interpretation, which has probably the longest, uh, it's the earliest interpretation we have of, and still uh, probably one of the dominant interpretations. Another is the alchemical interpretation. Now, there have been several alchemical interpretations of it. The one I'm going to use is a very specific interpretation uh, by Lorinda Dixon, which I'll explain to you uh, when we get there. Um, there is also another interpretation that you may run into. Now, one of the things that I usually don't do 
is say, something is wrong. I may say I don't agree with the interpretation or that I think the evidence is against it. Uh, and I may even strongly say that. And then I give you the evidence. And I'm going to do that. Um, but there is one interpretation that I can tell you is wrong uh, because it lacks the historical uh, evidence and all the historical evidence is against it. However, it had a fairly long life um, and a lot of people will still refer to it. And this is what I'm calling the heretical interpretation. Um, it's based in book, uh, several books actually, and articles, uh, by Franginger. And Franginger thought that this was an altarpiece for a heretical cult uh, called the Adamites, or the Brethren of the Free Spirit. Now, the reason I say that this is not possible, not just not likely, is because the Adamites existed a century earlier than this painting. They were last heard of in a trial, a heresy trial, in Brussels in 1416. To assume that Bosch had to be part of a heretical cult and he dies in 1516 would mean that he'd have to be, what, 120 years old when he's died? Not very likely. He wasn't even, probably wasn't even born in 1416. I mean, he lived to be an old man, we think, but that's stretching it a bit. Um, also, this particular cult was never heard of in Sahatogensbosch, where Bosch, you can see he takes his name from his town. Um, his family name, incidentally, was von Aachen. They evidently came from Aachen uh, in some earlier generation, but they'd been in Sahatogensbosch for long enough that Bosch just said, no, I'm Bosch, not Aachen. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, there is no way that Bosch could have been a member or have painted an, an imaginary because we never heard of the Adamites using older pieces either. So that is even imaginary. Um, and one other thing, everything we know about Bosch, and admittedly, we don't have a huge amount of documentation, indicates that he was a very orthodox Christian. Uh, indeed, probably, if we look at the evidence of his artwork, we would say that he seems to be very much afraid of damnation, um, which is certainly you know, one of the things that the preachers would uh, definitely harp on uh, in the uh, uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance. Um, we know that he painted for the church. We know that he was a member of a confraternity of the Virgin Mary. Um, neither of these would be something that a heretic would do. Uh, he wouldn't get any commissions. Uh, it would be impossible. So he probably was a very uh, orthodox, if I was a frightened uh, Christian. We don't know how he actually felt, uh, but certainly just looking at his artwork, he is always, uh, in a sense, warning the viewer that evil is present in the world. Um, it's just not a possible interpretation. Okay, gosh. Okay, so let's talk about these two interpretations that I'm going to discuss in class. One I'm calling the moral interpretation. And it, as I say, um, this is probably the most widespread of all of the interpretations. Uh, for one thing, it's the very first one. Now you'll notice how late that first interpretation was. It's only in 1600 that we have something written down about the meaning of this painting. So uh, 84 years later maybe, or 90 years later, you know. Uh, uh, so it's it said that only 16. So what, maybe 90 years later than the painting? Um, so. Um, we can only say what did it mean to the person who's writing this uh, in 1600. Now, he doesn't call it the Garden of Earthly Delights. That name had not yet been given to the painting. Um, he calls it the strawberry plant. 
Now, you saw that detail, and here you're looking at a very close detail of the bottom of the center panel. And in it, you saw these people with the sort of giant uh, fruit and seed pods, and they were you know, the, in various poses. Uh, and here, as you look at the detail, you see this giant strawberry uh, and this uh, other fruit, strawberry-like fruit, uh, spilling out its seed pods. So this is something, if you're standing in front of the picture, you know, you really would see close up. In this interpretation, they should talk about the strawberry as a, an emblem for the transitoriness of sensual pleasure. In other words, when you eat a strawberry, it is so sweet, but the taste doesn't last. And this is like the pleasures of the world. Um, things like lust, um, power, wealth, uh, all these things that seem to be so pleasurable and people seek out, uh, or the pleasures of uh, the, what they call the pleasures of flesh, uh, both sex and food, or too much drink, gluttony. Um, all of those things that uh, people get, uh, you know, people pursue in their life. But this is an error because these things will lead you, what, only to their sins. You can't take them with you, as they say. Uh, they won't help you get into heaven. And this is what we call a vanitas theme. Now, what do we mean by vanitas? Well, it's the Latin word for vanity. And of course, the word vanity has a whole lot of meanings. Um, you know, sometimes we think of it as somebody who is proud about their appearance or, uh, you know, they're very vain. Um, sometimes we even call a piece of furniture where they put on your makeup a vanity. Um, but there's another meaning probably from which this derived. Vanitas in this sense is what things are in vain. In other words, things that are useless. And it comes out of a book in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, in which the prophet goes through you know, all the things that are in the world, including much study as a weariness, <laughs> which I guess students would appreciate. Um, but all of these worldly pleasures. And after every one, he has a refrain. It's vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And why are these useless? You know, you, you, you go after power or wealth or sexual pleasure or uh, the pleasures of food and drink or even the pleasures of scholarship. And then you die. You really can't take it with you. So it's all in vain. You know, no matter what you accumulate, if you're the most, you know, richest, most powerful person in the world, you're gonna die. And so he, so the prophet laments, you know, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Everything is in vain. Well, of course, Christians interpret that somewhat differently. Uh, they interpret it as all worldly pleasures are in vain because they won't help you get into heaven. And in fact, they may ensure that you do not, that you go to hell instead. That you should have your mind not on earthly pleasures, which are only vanitas, or only vanity, but you should have your mind on spiritual things. And so in this interpretation of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Delights, or the strawberry plant, it's showing you all of these earthly pleasures, which are just like the strawberry, sweet for the moment, but in vain. Okay. 
Now, there are a number of people who have written about the moral interpretation. Um, I think I'm going to draw some of these things from Walter Gibson's. He was a uh, professor at Case Western Reserve, and he wrote a, he wrote a book on Bosch, and he wrote a number of articles on Bosch. Um, and when you look at the whole picture, not just the center, not just the bottom, if you look at the whole picture, he sees this as progressive, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, that you start with the left panel, which is Eden. It's Adam and Eve in Eden, you know, when the first people are created. And then you progress, as it were, uh, to sinful existence on earth. So it's like mankind's progress through sin, as sinful mankind. First, they are created in Eden, then they sin and they keep sinning and they continue to sin. So this center is showing their sinful existence on earth. And then the far right panel is hell. That's where these sinners are going to end up. So it's a warning. It's a moral warning that if you, you know, participate only in earthly pleasures, they are in vain, and in fact, they are detrimental. You're going to go to hell. That's the moral message there. Now, there is another painting by Bosch, which Gibson cites. In fact, interestingly enough, um, it's in the same room, in the same museum, in the Prado in, in uh, Madrid. Uh, and this is called the Haywain triptych. Haywain meaning hay wagon. You can see the big hay wagon there. And you can see it's laid out the same way, in a sense. You've got Eden on the left, yeah, with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And on the right, you've got a hell scene with all the torments of hell. And in the center, you have something quite unusual, you know, that just sort of begs to be interpreted, you know, something, what, what, we've never seen anything like this before in the center of a, uh, I, we don't know that it's an altarpiece, in fact, probably it isn't because it doesn't have a sacred scene in the center. Um, we don't even know how it was used. Uh, now, one of the reasons that we know what the Haywain triptych probably meant is because we actually have a Netherlandish proverb that seems to refer to it. Uh, translated, uh, the proverb goes, all the world's a haystack, and everyone grabs from it what he can. And that fits Bosch Haywain triptych perfectly. There is the hay wagon with its great haystack on it, and everyone is grabbing at it. Some people are killing each other for it. Um, they just want that hay, that worthless stuff, worldly things. And so that's the Netherlands proverb. Uh, it's also been compared to a, a verse in Isaiah where it says, all flesh is grass. Uh, all flesh, you know, all physical existence is like grass, which is there one day and can be burnt up the next. Now, it just doesn't last. So a kind of Vanitas image. In the center, you see this giant hay wagon. And up on the top, you see a garden of love. I'll show you a detail of that. And then way up in heaven, you see Jesus up in the clouds, holding out his hands, looking down, saying, I, I, you see my wounds? I, I died to save all of you. Look up, look up, <laughs> or something like that. And yet nobody is looking up except one angel who is praying very hard for all of these sinful people and doesn't seem to be doing any good. Uh, you'll notice that there's a whole uh, cavalcade of wealthy people, kings, popes, merchants, whoever, following the Haywain. Hey and then there's the more ordinary people who are uh, trying to grab the hay. Uh, some of them are even killing people in order to gain hay. Uh, one of them has got his hay and he's going to be crushed under the wheels of the Haywain. 
he gets his hay, but it doesn't profit him any. Other people are fighting over the hay. Uh, down below, you see people going into uh, a big bag of hay and there are what nuns and uh, uh, friars or monks here uh, who uh, are going to be enjoying that hay I guess uh, there seem to be for example like a quack doctor a charlatan uh, various people uh, and you know it's all the pursuit of hay well you know what's hay you know hay is something that is virtually valueless uh, it's not important and so hay here serves as a metaphor, if you will, for earthly things, for power, wealth, excessive food and drink, you know, sexual pleasure, whatever. Um, and you may notice that who is drawing this hay wagon? They're devils. They're these hybrid monstrous creatures who are pulling the hay wagon into Hell, which is the left pan, uh, which is the right panel. Uh, let's take a little closer look at uh, here one of the details. This is the little garden of love at the top. Uh, you know, it seems to us perhaps a little harmless. Your musician is playing music, and you have two couples, one of whom is embracing. Well, it wasn't considered harmless. It was considered uh, the sin of lust is brought on by you know this romantic music and as you can see uh, some of the one of the couple is definitely engaging in lustful behavior you'll note that there is a devil here whose nose is a long uh, some kind of flute or uh, uh, some kind of instrument uh, it's as though he's piping them to hell uh, and then uh, the owl. Owls, of course, have a lot of different uh, symbols and associated with, being, uh, with uh, Athena. You think of the bird of wisdom. But here we think that they are associated with the night and, and devils, and so that this is a negative symbol in this case. Uh, and there is that angel praying, praying, praying for them, and they take no note. And as you see, he's looked up. We remember that Christ is up above there, uh, presiding over all. So, as Gibson interprets this, and in fact, as, as I think probably, I want to say everybody, uh, I don't know of anybody who doesn't, but certainly uh, the uh, obvious interpretation would be that uh, we have Eden in the middle, uh, we have Eden in the left uh, panel, uh, and here you can see uh, a number of scenes um, you know, from the story of Eden. In fact, starting even before, you have up in the sky, you have uh, God uh, casting out the rebel angels, uh, the ones who will become the devils. So there is, you know, evil in heaven is being cast out. And then down below, uh, you can see the creation of Eve, and then uh, the original sin, the fall of man, when Adam and Eve first take the forbidden fruit. And then at the very bottom, uh, you have the angel, um, you know, expelling Adam and Eve. It's called the expulsion. Adam and Eve being expelled from uh, the earthly paradise of the Garden of Eden. And you'll notice that Eve is actually facing right into that center panel as though, you know, they are their descendants, you know, will go in there. And then you see this allegory of uh, mankind uh, grabbing the hay from the hay wagon that is being pulled by devils straight into hell. So here you see the angel praying, the lovers ignoring Christ, but he spreads out his hands to show you his wounds. It's possible. You can be saved. You don't have to go to hell. <laughs> uh, and there you see the continuation. In Eden, mankind begins to sin. In the center, mankind continues to sin. And then in hell, mankind is punished for his sin. And according to Gibson and others, that's the same layout, as you can see. It is the same layout, in a sense, uh, of the Garden of Delights and the Haywain. And he thinks that the meaning is very, very similar, that in the center is the continuation of sin where you end up in hell. Um, 
And just showing you a detail here, uh, this is sometimes called the cavalcade, uh, in which you have this pool of water uh, with these uh, naked young ladies, uh, beauties uh, within, and the male figures are riding different animals, uh, and different animals are processing in a circle around them. Uh, and it's often suggested that some of these animals uh, refer to some of the seven deadly sins, uh, uh, the boar or the pig to glutton tree, uh, the goat, the horse, the stag uh, to lust, uh, you know, these uh, giant cats, leopard-like, lion-like creatures, maybe to collar or uh, anger. And uh, this is paralleled with a late 15th century German woodcut showing the seven deadly sins on symbolic animals. Uh, in this case, they are female figures. They're led by the devil, and they're carrying banners uh, of different animals, but once again, symbolic of the different sins. Uh, I must tell you, of course, that in that, uh, uh, it makes a wonderful parallel to Bosch. Um, and oftentimes you can find uh, parallels in things like popular prints uh, that do relate to what Bosch is doing, but he does it. He does it with much more imagination and, and skill, of course. Uh, you do also find images of the, uh, the virtues riding the symbolic animals, uh, as well as the devils, of course, as well as the sins uh, here led by the devil. And here we're back, uh, looking at the Garden of Delights again. Well, of course, not everybody thinks this completely explains the painting. Um, and even people who think it, you know, certainly it's one layer, one level of uh, explanation. Uh, you can find, uh, I guess you could say, at least uh, one fault in it, is you look at the Garden of Eden, you don't see the fall of man. You don't see Adam and Eve sinning. What you see uh, has been called the marriage of Adam and Eve, uh, or Christ introducing, God uh, introducing, uh, and of course Christ is part of God, and often um, God created the world by the word, and Christ is identified with the word, so here, uh, you know, sort of interchangeably, and there is a long history of that. Uh, but anyway, we have uh, Christ slash God uh, introducing uh, Eve to Adam, or marrying uh, Adam and Eve, but we don't see them actually sinning. We don't see them actually taking the forbidden fruit. So wouldn't that be what you would show if you wanted to see, here's the beginning of sin, here's sin continuing, and then of course the wages of sin, the uh, punishment for sin uh, in hell. Lorinda Dixon, um, wrote her dissertation on Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Delights. Uh, she is a professor at uh, Syracuse University, uh, and she got her PhD uh, from uh, Boston University. And I was at a conference where she first presented this uh, in uh, 1980. And I will tell you, I went to scoff. I didn't know her at the time. I do now. Uh, and I went to scoff and I came away, oh, that was marvelous. <laughs> and I think everybody in the room felt that way. It was a wonderful presentation. And what was so convincing was that she had, every time she would talk to you about something that she said was an alchemical symbol or reference, she had images from alchemical and health texts that really paralleled what you see in Bosch Garden of Delights. In her dissertation, she has almost a hundred of these different uh, images that are so close. Uh, of course, in a 20-minute paper, she couldn't show all of them, and I can't show you all in class, but I'll show you a few of them. Now, there had been alchemical interpretations. They had said that, uh, you know, these evil alchemists. Uh, now, when you think of alchemy, I think today a lot of people think, oh yeah, these you know crazy, nutsy people trying to change lead into gold. That's what alchemists do. Um, and that was in part part of the previous alchemical interpretations, these you know evil people seeking wealth rather than uh, uh, spiritual treasure. However, 
Dixon looked at it historically rather than sort of the prototype mad scientist trying to change lead into gold, she looked at it and how was alchemy regarded in its own day? It was not just changing lead into gold. It was uh, what she calls a fossil science. In other words, a science that fossilized. Uh, you could say it's the uh, ancestor of chemistry, but the chemist would tell you that it's not very scientific. Um, but there was a whole theory about it. Uh, it has religious meaning, and it has a, a theory of how uh, the world worked, I guess you would say medieval science. Uh, the word science, of course, uh, has changed its meaning. Originally it meant knowledge, scientia. It didn't have to be changing lead into gold. It was the science of distillation. And they believed that when you distilled substances, uh, you could transmute them or change them from one substance to another. Uh, you could concentrate them too, you know, get the essence of something. And you could do things like make medicine. So not everybody is, okay, I called them a mad scientist, uh, uh, who's, who's using alchemy. Um, you know, people often spoke very highly of uh, people who could distill medicines, for example, to use alchemy for good. Uh, they were trying to transmute one object into another. Uh, we might say it couldn't be done. I understand now they can change lead into gold using, uh, you know, nuclear uh, reactors or something. But it's uh, it's not worth the trouble. It costs more than the gold ever would. Uh, but of course, they they didn't have anything like that, and they're doing a whole different concept. It's part of medieval medicine, which is based on the idea of the four humors. Now, what are these four humors? I think you could kind of think of them like hormones. You know, there's substances in your body. And uh, many of these words we still have in our language. The idea was if, for example, your body had too much black bile, you would be melancholic. We'd say you'd be depressed. But, you know, the word melancholic is still used. You know, somebody is melancholic. If you had too much yellow bile, you would be choleric. You'd be angry all the time. If you had too much phlegm, you would be phlegmatic, you know, phlegm in your lungs, uh, which would lead you to be slothful, tired all the time, lazy. Or you know, you might have, what, an excess of blood, which was uh, made you sanguine. Uh, and I guess that was supposed to be about the best one. It, it didn't help you with your spiritual matters. Uh, but when you were sanguine, you were what we might call hail fellow well met. Uh, you know, you were, uh, you enjoyed life, uh, you know, and uh, cracked a lot of jokes, maybe spent too much time at the tavern. Uh, but uh, it didn't help you. Uh, to gain uh, heaven. So uh, any of these was an excess. Now, how, what, what happened? Why do people have these diseases? And you know, dis-ease, uh, you know, implies you're not at ease, uh, was believed to be called by an imbalance of humors. You know, too much black bile and you're melancholic. And the idea was that originally, when Adam and Eve were created, they had the perfect balance of humors. They did not have any disease. But when they committed the original sin, the sin of disobedience, this brought disease and death into the world. So we often say that you know the, the sin of man, the original sin, uh, mankind brought sin and death into the world. But also they believed it brought disease. And disease was caused by an imbalance of humors. So, how do you make people well? Well, you have to restore the balance of humors. So, virtuous alchemists and apothecaries might be among them, would try to distill medicines that would bring the body back into medicine. Now, you know, if you really wanted to go to the, the ultimate thing, I mean, you know, most people were, you know, 
making medicines. And, you know, we can, some of them, of course, were pretty, uh, by our standards, grotesque. But here's, here's just a, here's a more palatable example. Uh, let's say you are hot and dry. You have a fever. You know, we'd say, drink, take vitamin C and drink lots of fluids. Well, what if you had someone who said, okay, we, we are hot and dry, so we have to find something that is cold and moist to balance your humors. And you are wealthy enough to afford oranges. So you take oranges which are cold and moist and you distill the essence of the orange. We'd say you get vitamin C. Uh, and you distill that and then that becomes your medicine. Now in that case, it might actually help. Uh, in a lot of cases, of course, none of these, uh, some of these medicines did not help at all. Uh, but let's say you want to go beyond just curing that fever of the day. Um, what if you just hoped that there was some way you could make mankind always healthy? Well, sort of the ultimate of the alchemists, uh, these are the ones who are not seeking lead into gold, they're not seeking their own gain, they want to do something good for mankind, um, they might try to discover a panacea or a, um, a medicine that would cure everything. Or could they possibly distill the elixir of life? Some of you know Harry Potter? Remember the Sorcerer's Stone? This is the same thing in liquid form, as it were. And the idea was if you could find this perfect medicine, uh, you know, not only cure disease, but it could also restore people to the balance that they had before sin and death entered the world, and they could live. They wouldn't have to die. Now, whether you're trying to get your temporary cure for your, or this hope for something like the elixir of life, um, when you look at alchemical and health texts of the time, um, they often have some very strange pictures and some, what seemed to us, very strange language. Instead of trying to be scientific in the modern sense, which they didn't have, uh, they would use symbolic languages and images to describe the process of is distillation. And Lorinda Dixon noticed that these illustrations look remarkably like Bosch's images. So she felt that each panel referred to a different state in the process of distillation. And so here we are, you know, looking at uh, the uh, scene of uh, the Garden of Eden. And you have uh, Christ here um, introducing or marrying Adam and Eve, bringing them together. Uh, the tree under which uh, Adam sits is known as a dragon palm uh, and shows up in a lot of alchemical texts. Uh, you might notice that in the background you have this uh, fountain or structure or is it a plant? In other words, you look at this thing and you say, is this animal, vegetable, or mineral? You know, what is this thing uh, in the background here, in the, in the middle ground, actually? Uh, is, it, is it growing? Is it created? What is it? Um, and it suggests maybe that it is between those things. You know, is it transmuting from one form to another? And then, of course, you can see the animals in the background. Uh, you have unicorns uh, purifying the water with their horns, perhaps. Unicorns are what to do. You have an elephant. You have a giraffe. We actually have the book uh, from which Bosch co copied these exotic figures. I, he undoubtedly never saw one, uh, but there was a book with pictures that he used. So the left panel could be called the marriage of Adam and Eve. At least that seems to be what's going down in the foreground. And interestingly enough, in alchemical allegory, the first step in the process of distillation is when you take two disparate elements, two things that are very different. You want to unite these different things, you know, hot, cold, moist, dry, 
you have two things that have these opposite characteristics and you put them in your beaker or your alembic or your test tube or whatever you're going to put them in. Uh, you put them in your beaker. So you're going to try to distill them together and, and you know, make them transformed. And that step is actually goes by the name of the marriage of Adam and Eve, two different things, male and female, being joined together. Here's our detail from Bosch, and here is a detail from an alchemical text. And as you can see, here is Christ in the center. They actually thought that um, the agent that might work this transmutation was red mercury which incidentally is extremely poisonous and yes some alchemists poisoned themselves to death for the use of uh, use of this red mercury and Christ was known as the mercurius you know that he was identified with this they they thought this they thought it was a very effective mineral. Uh, and you may notice that Christ in uh, Bosch's picture is red or rose-colored, uh, light red. Uh, and here in our alchemical book, we have a much cruder drawing, uh, but Adam and Eve are being joined. They're literally becoming one. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, they're being married. They are being joined together. Uh, here's another alchemical text in which you have an alchemical fountain uh, with Adam and Eve in the fountain and these uh, plant forms winding around uh, the center. Uh, it's not identical to what you're seeing, but here you see a uh, Bosch. Is, it, uh, is that an alchemical fountain? Uh, you know, it seems to have some plant-like forms, uh, and as I said, it almost looks like it's transmuting from one thing to another. Animal, vegetable, mineral. What is it? And uh, she brings in many, many more examples, of course. I'm just showing you a few. In the center, you see these nude figures uh, cavorting, for better of a word. Uh, some of them are engaged in uh, what I would say some quite uh, suggestive activities. Um, and this has been suggested uh, that this refers to the next step in the process of distillation. You put two disparate elements, two different things in your beaker and you light the fire under it. And now they're being joined, uh, conjunction. And these elements, these different things are bubbling happily together. And here is a picture from an alchemical text, not showing adults, but showing the uh, disparate elements as little children uh, playing or uh, cavorting, uh, calling it child's play. And uh, you know they're bubbling happily together, as the, the text says. Now, these are adults. Uh, they're not exactly engaged in child's play. Uh, in fact, here is a detail. I think this was the one that convinced me she had something there. Um, because here is another one of those alchemical fountains, or is it a plant? Is it mineral form? You know, something that's, that's in the middle of the water, anyway. Uh, and, you know, it reminds us of an alchemical beaker. And you see here, uh, two images uh, of alchemical beakers and as conjunction is going on and as the fire is bubbling uh, it compares it to two things uh, one to mating behavior which you see going on there uh, and the other turning upside down you know just uh, bubbling together and, and there's the figure during a flip, it's turned upside down and of course you look over at the Bosch uh, what uh, alchemical fountain, beaker, whatever it is, uh, and you see uh, the couples uh, you know, engaging in uh, mating behavior, uh, including the two that are standing on their heads. <laughs> Not quite sure how that works. Uh, but at any rate, they're standing on their heads, and uh, this is sort of a, a, what, a conjoining of these two different ideas, perhaps, uh, seems to uh, fit. Uh, you see throughout Bosch pictures uh, some of these crystalline vials uh, that seem to be uh, what are like early test tubes. Uh, and you also see similar ones in alchemical texts. And then we get to the right panel. And that is easily identified as what it looks like to us. It looks like a hell scene. Uh, 
But according to this in alchemical interpretation, it stands for the stage of putrefaction, when the elements are now burnt and blackened, and they are likened to a fiery hell. And of course, if you know, if you distill something, you would have uh, you know a tube going off into uh, another beaker where it would collect uh, you know the the distilled water and the essence of whatever those objects are, uh, probably someplace else. But what's left of the elements are putrefaction, blackened, burnt, and in the alchemical process, these have are this step is called hell, <laughs> as well as putrefaction. So let's take a look at that. So here we see a background of uh, the hell scene in Bosch's Garden of Delights. And you see it looks like a fiery city. And then look over here at uh, some of those examples. And at the bottom we see hell or the alchemical step of hell or putrefaction uh, likened to a fiery city. Uh, it's crudely drawn, uh, but it's certainly clear, you know, the fire is coming up, destroying all these towers which are falling over. Right above it, we see this big monster with its open mouth with flames, and in it is an alchemical beaker, uh, you know, being boiled. And of course, this is what we call a hell mouth. Uh, very frequently in medieval and even in Renaissance images, uh, you will have uh, the entrance to hell shown as this great monster with an open mouth, and uh, you can see the flames within. So this is uh, the alchemical hell, uh, using the traditional uh, symbolism but with the addition of an alchemical beaker in the monster's mouth. So here we're going back, just reminding what the whole thing looks like. Eden, people having a good time, I guess. Uh, the earthly delights in the center, perhaps, and then hell on the right. So here, we're going to go to this. Um, this is another detail from the hell scene. This figure is sometimes called the tree man because as you can see, one of his legs looks like a tree growing up. Uh, he's also called the egg man because the body uh, looks like a, a, a hollowed out broken egg. Um, and indeed, there are many of these eggs and they are, uh, there are what they call an alchemical egg, another one of these uh, uh, vessels. That you, you can find. Uh, but I'm not, not showing you that. I'm showing you a different kind of alchemical vessel. And you might notice that the shape of these, in the little black and white image, looks very much like the shape of the bagpipe. Uh, and you see this disc on this monstrous devil's head. Uh, and you can see the devil is uh, pulling uh, their you know, human beings around kind of a, you know, a dance forever around this giant bagpipe. Now, in the moral interpretation, uh, the bagpipe is a symbol of lust. And I asked my professor why. And he said, because it resembles the male genitalia. I guess a little scale is a question there, but uh, it was conceived as a sexual uh, symbol sometimes uh, during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And I'll also tell you another little story. Um, I was on a trip to Europe and I was in Vicenza in northern Italy. And I was going to be leaving Italy the next day and uh, going to Munich. And uh, I was sort of hoarding my money because I had to pay my hotel bill and I had to get dinner that night and you know I wasn't sure how far it stretch. So I wasn't having a lot of money to throw around. But there was a street musician who was playing a bagpipe which looked very much like this. Not a Scottish bagpipe, you know, playing a martial air. And of course he wanted me to give him money, you know, as street musicians of course do. But I didn't. I have sometimes, but in that occasion, I wasn't sure whether I'd be able to pay for my meal that night. <laughs> uh, and he did not like this, and he followed me playing this bagpipe, and I almost cracked up. I will tell you, all I can tell you, I wish I had a tape recorder, it sounded 
lewd. And I thought, now I understand. He was mocking me. You know, he was trying to make me feel bad because I hadn't given him any money. I thought, that is the reason why <laughs> they consider this such a lewd instrument. It even sounds that way. As I say, not the Scottish martial airs, a very different blating of the bagpipe. Okay, so that would apply to the moral interpretation. And indeed, the figures within the hell, uh, the within this uh, egg, are sometimes considered to be the evil alchemists, uh, with their fires down in there. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the shape of this lewd bag pipe resembles the shape of alchemical beakers. So, well, isn't that interesting? Okay, let's go and look at the entire image again. Uh, we have Eden, we have uh, the uh, people engaged in earthly delights in the center, which hence the name that has been given to this, and then the hell scene. And remember that these are hinged. It's a triptych that does fold, and so you can fold over Eden and hell, and what do you see on the outside? you see a globe of the world. And in this interpretation, this is the earth in the process of creation, a process of coming into being. Now, I'll give you an example of why we think that. Uh, but it also, according to Dixon, refers to the final state of distillation purification or ablution. And that, of course, is when uh, you have that uh, liquid essence <laughs> of the uh, whatever you were trying to uh, meld together and transmute. Uh, so this is the cleansing, the purification. Uh, and as you can see, it looks very watery within this uh, crystalline, transparent globe. Now look way up on the upper left corner and you will see an image of God, the Father, and a verse from Psalms. And it's in Latin, but it would translate something like, He spoke, and it was created. You know, God spoke, and the world comes into being. And it's very interesting when you look at When you look at the detail here, you notice that, yes, you know, it's like the dry land is becoming separate from the water, and yet there are objects within it that it does seem to be transmuting from one thing to another. And there are even, look over here on the far left, what looks like a little test tube with a tail on it. And so we have the idea of creation as a kind of alchemical transmutation. You know, God as the great alchemist. And here we see uh, an image of the world in an alchemical beaker. We see God creating with a an example of uh, this you know, circular form in which he is creating the world. Uh, you actually see one of these alchemical eggs which has survived uh, down below this uh, uh, alchemical vessel. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are just many, many egg forms within uh, the Garden of Delights. And here's the alchemist uh, you know, with his uh, circular vessel. And here, here then we look at the whole thing once again. Okay, so now I have a question for you, a thought. Uh, this is my thought. <laughs> uh, I, I actually did go to, to uh, uh, Lorinda Dixon and ask her, I said, you know, do you think that this, you know, supersedes, I forget how I phrased it, but do you think that the moral and allegor alchemical interpretation could be you're going on in two different levels on the same work of art, or, you know, are they mutually exclusive? And she said, oh no, you know, uh, you know, it doesn't negate 
the moral interpretation. And so I once gave a paper about that. So here's the, I guess, a rhetorical question, because I think they can be. Uh, can the moral interpretation and the alchemical interpretation be reconciled? Can they, could you have both meanings within one work of art? We know that when people read texts, like the Bible, for example, but other things as well, sometimes you can read more than one meaning. You might have a literal meaning, you might have an allegorical meaning, and then when you get into the Bible, you can also have additional layers of meaning. So could this be one thing to, you might call it the casual observer who looks at it and says, oh, I see what's happening. You know, people are behaving badly and they're going to hell. Or to the person who has some alchemical knowledge, could it be sort of this uh, secondary, uh, you know, secret to those who have no alchemical knowledge uh, interpretation? And remember, the alchemical books were written that way. Uh, you know, those in the know could understand them. You know, if you really didn't know, they weren't trying to explain it to you. You know, it was alchemical and hidden and, uh, um, you know, for the, the elect, select people who knew about it. Um, so I'm suggesting that you could read it on two levels. Both suggest that mankind must undergo a kind of spiritual distillation, which you could say is analogous to the alchemical process. If he is to find the elixir of life, the remedy for sin and disease. And what is that remedy? Well, you know, they were hoping to find an actual medicine, but it's also identified with Christ. Christ is often allegorically using, you know, Christ himself is the elixir. And we're talking here about the uh, virtuous alchemists, you know, who uh, recognize that Christ himself would be, it uh, uh, is, you know, the source of all life, uh, Christ and God being, you know, one in being with the Father. Um, uh, maybe I should leave all that down. So the elixir may be an actual medicine, but it can also be identified with Christ and his expiation of sin. So there is your moral message for that time uh, and period. So on one level, you have it as, uh, you have the alchemical allegory, 